So Jesus said to those who had come to believe in him, If you remain in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. But they answered, We are the descendants of Abraham. We have never been slaves to anyone. So how can you say we will become free? You see, they answered Jesus in the same way we might. I mean, we're Americans, right? We live in the land of the free. We sing songs about it. We get together and have parties and fireworks, all to celebrate our nation's freedom. But Jesus was speaking of a different kind of freedom, a freedom that can only be found in Him. He answered them, This is the truth. Everyone who chooses a life of sin isn't free. They are a slave to sin. A slave has no permanent place in the family. But a son or a daughter, they belong forever. So if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. Good morning, St. Andrew's family. We are so glad to have you in worship with us this morning. As we celebrate our freedom as a nation, we're going to remember and celebrate our freedom that we have in Christ. So we're going to sing about that freedom this morning. Sing with us. Step out of the shadows, step out of the grave, break into the wild, and don't be afraid, and run into wide open spaces, grace is waiting for you, and dance like the weight has been lifted, grace is and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Come out of the dark, just as you are, into the fullness of His love. For the Spirit is here, let there be Grace is waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted. Grace is waiting. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom. Come out of the dark, just as you are. To the fullness of His love, for the Spirit is here. Let there be freedom. Let there be freedom. Chains will fall. Prisons shake at the sound of Jesus' name. And lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. Sing that out! Shakes will fall, prisons shake at the sound of Jesus' name. And lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. Yeah. 
you joining with us in worship this morning. If you have any prayer, requ prayer requests for us today, please share them with us in the chat screen, or you can fill out the form on saumc.life after the service. Today is Communion Sunday, as you can probably see. So if you haven't already done it, make sure that you get your elements together so that you can have communion with us later in the service. Also take a quick minute, fill out a Connect card with us uh, online so that we can know who's worshiping with us. Remember, you only need to do one for family. As I'm sure you guys are well aware, the COVID-19 cases are definitely rising in our area. So our team of, of people who are working so hard to reopen our church have decided right now it's best for us to just push that back a little bit. So they are, they're gonna continue meeting and continue watching and we will definitely be letting you know as soon as we have a date for reopening. Next. We are super excited. We have some special guests with us who are only going to be guests for a short time, and then they're going to be family with us, like, like so many of us around here feel. Um, so we're excited to welcome them into our family. I'm going to invite Brent Duran up. He is the SPR chair, and he's going to introduce our new pastors to you this morning. Good morning. How fitting is it that on this July 4th day weekend, we get to engage in celebrating our freedom of religion by welcoming our new co-pastors and their family to our church. Reverends Gary and Jane Rideout and their daughters, Natalie and Meredith, are joining us today. And I know many of you have already been impressed with the Rideout, so if you had the opportunity to view the video that they put online this Friday talking about the reopening. You can tell they work extremely well together, and I think they're going to be a true blessing to this church. First of all, let me highlight that Natalie and Meredith, Natalie 20 and Meredith 18, are their pride and joy as their daughters, and they will be attending the University of Florida this upcoming year. So hopefully that'll start on time and you'll be able to do that. So we hope and pray that that works for you as well as all the other college students. Gary... Um, Gary was born in Indiana and did most of his adult life before joining the ministry in, in Dallas, Texas. Then he went to seminary where he was in for a great delight other than just finding the Lord. Jane was born in Michigan and she found her way to the Sunshine State a little bit earlier and did about four years in Fort Lauderdale before she went to seminary at Asbury. So while they were both in seminary at Asbury Seminary, they met one another 
while they were there learning more about the Lord and how to serve him and married. And we're so blessed to have them with us now. Following their uh, time at seminary, they were assigned to Winter Haven United Methodist Church. I'm sorry. Winter Park. I apologize, Winter Park. Uh, Winter Park. And they were blessed to have them with them for a period of time. Gary served there 21 years. And Jane served there 16 years. And so they've been there. They've learned a lot about how to work with large churches. So we're very excited about having them join us here at our church. Along with that, they've moved here to join us. They've already been actively involved in the church to try to get started. They've already with the uh, reopening team, and they've already been working with our, with our church leadership. So we feel extremely blessed to have them with us. You'll have an opportunity to hear from them a little later. As you can see, the big reveal will come later when they remove their mask and speak with us as a congregation. We're all looking forward to that. So uh, join me as we welcome them, and we're very thankful and pleased to have you with us. And we will have an opportunity to say that a little later today. Thank you, and God bless. We want to invite everyone to come to church after following, immediately following the 1115 service today. They're going to have a drive through uh, welcome and uh, just come by, say hi, introduce yourselves to the rideouts. So please join us after the 1115 service for that today. Now, as we prepare our hearts for worship, the rest of our service today, um, I want you guys to check out a quick video. If you feel led to give this morning, there's a giving link in the chat screen, or you can mail a check to St. Andrews. We thank you for your continuous generosity as we are going through these difficult times. As a church, we still have ministries that need to thrive. We still have people in our community that we need to serve. So thank you for those of you who continue to give generously to our church and to the mission of our church. beginning can't control what tomorrow will bring but I know here in the middle is the place where you promise to be I'm not enough unless you come All I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? As I walk now through the valley. Let your love 
deep in the shadow. You know, I found in my personal life that it's in those times when I feel empty, I feel lonely, I feel helpless. It's in those times that I feel I can see God moving the most. I can feel, I can sense his presence the most. And I think sometimes he just allows us to get in these places, these valleys. We go through these trials and these things in our lives so that we have nothing left. So that we only have him.
so that we're so empty. We're, we've hit rock bottom and we don't know what to do. We don't know where to turn. We don't know what our next step is going to be. And it's, sometimes it's at that point where we just cry out. We're like, God, I need you. And I think sometimes it's, it's in those moments where we can really see his hand at work in our lives. When we say, God, I'm not enough. I've tried it all. I don't know what else to do. Fill me. I need you. And I think it's in those moments that we see the true power that only God has to move in our lives, to work on our behalf. And so it's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to, to get stressed out and to just feel like we don't, we don't know what, what to do. But I think it's when our faith is tested. That's when we, that's when we lean in a little bit more. We just let him hold us. We let him comfort us. We allow him to be our peace and our hope and our joy. So I don't know where you are right now. I know the world around us is a crazy place right now, especially. But I hope that in these times, in these times of desperation and in the unknown and uncertainty, that you will just fall to your knees and ask God to just move. Don't worry about anything else that's going on around you. Just give him all you've got, which may not be a whole lot right now. I encourage you, wherever you are in your walk, lean in a little bit more today. Allow God to give you that peace and that comfort that so many people are longing for right now. But it's not until, it's not until we get to that place where we know that we need him, that we acknowledge that we need a savior. I think sometimes that's, that's we have to get to that place to, to really see him moving in our lives sometimes. can wait I've come to seek your face and everything else can wait I'm here for you and I want to just be There's 
nothing I want more Cause nothing matters more There's nothing I want more More than you, God Cause nothing matters more Sing that from your heart this morning There's nothing I want more Nothing matters more. There's nothing I want more. Cause nothing matters more. Now to be here at your feet, at your feet, all to me. Well, good morning. We're so excited to be here at St. Andrews uh, at a new appointment, though it's not exactly the way we expected it to be, the way we anticipated it to be. We were hoping we could be able to meet you in person, uh, face to face, and greet you with a handshake and a hug, but it is not to be. Jane and I have, have known about this move for quite a long time, and we've been anticipating this move for a long time, too. We're so glad to be here today. Uh, I suspect you were eager f for us to come here too. I can tell by the, by the way we were welcomed here at this church. We have received, we've been inundated with cards and emails and welcoming us and wishing us well uh, here at this new church. And when we, when we got to the parsonage, I couldn't believe it, opened the refrigerator, the refrigerator is full of food from uh, prepared meals and uh, I have to say the, the ice cream went really fast, but thank you. Uh, but it, it's just, we, we're inundated with, uh, overwhelmed by uh, the welcome we got. We walked in, there were balloons, there were banners, there were plants, there were flowers in the parsonage waiting for us. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Moving is a challenging time, and many, uh, many of you know that. Um, and it's especially challenging when you've been at your previous place for many, many years, which we had. But you have made this transition so comfortable and so easy for us, and we thank you for that. Um, we look forward to meeting with you uh, this, this, uh, after 11.15 service. Uh, socially distanced as a drive-through, so wave to us, and we can at least try to, try to get a face with a name. And uh, uh, So we hope you can make it there. It'll be in a per church parking lot after the 11.15 service. We have been watching on live stream for the past few weeks, and I kind of feel like we already know this church. We know that what a wonderful worship team we have here at this service, 945. So they, they, did a, they do a wonderful, get you in the right spirit to worship God. And uh, already we know that this church is one that values worship, values worship uh, through prayer, through music, through the scripture, through reading the message. And Jane and I are so excited to be a part of this worshiping community. Jane and I talked about how we would introduce ourselves for the first time, who would preach first. We thought, well, let's just share the message today. We're both going to preach today. Now, now don't worry, it's not going to be a two-hour service today. We're each going to speak for a little bit and share with you so you get to know each other and, and introduce ourselves a little bit. 
but we have a lot to celebrate today, not just that we're worshiping here together, that we're new pastors here at the church, but also we're celebrating Holy Communion. And also the uh, uh, celebrating Independence Day, the birth of our, of our country that we've been honoring this past weekend. Don't want to spend too much time more introducing ourselves or telling a little bit about us. Uh, we've got time for that. You already know a little bit from what Brent had told you. But I do too want to tell you one story. Uh, as Brent had said, Jane and I met at Asbury Theological Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky. Uh, I was there uh, my first year, my first week. We had an orientation at the president's home. Uh, the president back then was Dr. Maxie Dunham. You may know that name. And I walked into the library and there was Jane. And Jane was a student volunteer. She had been there for a year already. And that's where we met. Uh, and uh, actually about one year later, I proposed to her. And with the permission of Dr. Dunham, I asked if we could go, if I could propose to her in that same room in his house in the library. And he let us do that. But before moving off to seminary, I was a computer programmer living in Jacksonville, Florida, and going to Riverside Park United Methodist Church, which is in downtown Jacksonville. Uh, when one of the, uh, well, I felt a, a call, a sense of call into the ministry during that time. And then one of our uh, uh, church members, a gracious lady named Lois, you could probably say she was the church matriarch, she came up to me and she said, Gary, I hear you're wanting to go into the ministry, and I want, I want, there's somebody I want you to meet. It's a former pastor here at Riverside Park. And I want you to meet him because he's such a godly man with great wisdom. And he can teach you a lot about what it is to be in the ministry and, and help you on your journey. So I did meet that man. And that man was Pastor J.C. Powell. And when I found out that I was coming to St. Andrews and he was one of the founding members, uh, the founding clergy of the church, and he was also at that time the interim pastor, well, I just got chills up and down my spine. I mean, God is truly in this, I felt to myself. And, you know, it, it, it is scary when you're going to a new appointment, especially when you've been to one, a long, one for a long period of time. But knowing that God is in this gave me such a profound sense of assurance and peace in this anxious time of life. God is in our midst with, with perfect love that cast out fear. And Jane and I are honored to carry on traditions, these great traditions of this church, and carry on the legacy of Pastor J.C. and Pastor Garrett uh, here at this church as we discern together the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, one word that we've been hearing a lot lately in the last few weeks is the word unprecedented. This time is a time that is unprecedented. We're living in a time where our whole lives have been drastically altered because of this COVID-19 pandemic. Our lives have changed. The ways we do things, we can't meet together anymore. We're avoiding crowds. We're avoiding shopping centers. We're living differently with new lifestyles. And there are very hurtful things about this crisis. We can't be near our loved ones. We can't uh, hug each other, hold our grandbabies, celebrate birthdays or graduations together. And sadly, many have succumbed to the, uh, the illness of this virus, and some have lost their lives. It's a time that's unprecedented. And obviously, in this present situation, we've said it over and over again, we can't be with you to worship with you for the first time. And what's, also what's aggravated about this whole thing, we don't know when this is going to end. We don't know when we'll be able to open up and be with our family and hug our grandbabies again and celebrate uh, things together, celebrate the... Uh, milestones in our lives together and it's also an unprecedented time in our lives in our in, in our world because of the unrest and the tension brought upon by the untimely deaths of certain black individuals causing many to rethink how we relate to persons of different race and different ethnicity all of this is a lot to take in at one time and I'm sure those out there, you have some things going on in your life that makes this an unprecedented time for you. you, you you've got new pastors here at the church. And for, for us, we're moving away to a new place, and we'll soon be empty nesters. I know some of you know what that feels like because our youngest is going off to you, University of Florida in the fall if they go have classes there. And then the loss of Jane's beloved mother this past week. Uh, in Michigan, a godly woman with great grace that will truly miss her. And we want to thank everyone that sent cards of encouragement and condolence and comfort. It really has warmed us and made us uh, feel comforted. 
It truly is an unprecedented time. Yet, that's something we hear over and over again, and we're kind of tired of it. And we look at this time with great, we could look at this time with great fear and trepidation. Yet, is it possible to look at this unprecedented time not just in despair? But this can be a time where we can do so with open spirits, with open hearts, to see where God will lead us. Unprecedented could mean a time when God opens up new opportunities for us. All we have to do is humbly and see vividly God's movement in the world, in our community, in our lives, that will be remarkable and powerful. Now, the scripture that Jane and I have chosen for this first worship service is 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 10, a passage that reminds us that we can put our hope in God and put our trust in God during these challenging times. In unprecedented times, it is common for us to lose hope and focus on the circumstances in our lives and lose hope of God. Let me read this passage, and then Jane will come up and share about this passage. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 10. But this is precisely what is written. God has prepared things for those who love him that no eye has seen or ear has heard or that hasn't crossed the mind of any human being. God has revealed these things to us through the Spirit. The Spirit searches everything, including the depths of God. Good morning. I'm the short one in our family, so this down. This past um, Friday night, our family gathered around Disney Plus and along with much of the country watched the Broadway showing of Hamilton on TV. Um, we were so excited. We loved it and it did not disappoint in any way. Um, this past Christmas, we actually had this opportunity to see it in person. Uh, a family member had gifted us some tickets to go see Hamilton. And we were so excited, and so we were extremely intentional in preparing. We, um, for months ahead, we started listening to the, the songs. In fact, my girls have memorized much of it, of the dialogue. And, and we, you know, Gary um, found some, some information, some background story on, on what it all meant. We didn't actually read the book, but we did look into it because we wanted to experience Hamilton to its fullest. Now, the reason I share this is because that's the way we should approach Scripture. To really understand Scripture to the fullest, you need to have some real clear guidance. So when we, when we read Scripture, we need to look to those theologians, to those Bible scholars who will help us understand um, exactly what the authors are trying to say to us, the message that the Holy Spirit has laid on their heart to share. And so this morning, I want to give you a little bit of context to what um, the Apostle Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, what he's trying to say to us through this verse. So let me tell you a little bit about what's going on um, with this particular chapter. So the Apostle Paul, this is actually probably not the first letter, but the second letter he has sent to the Corinthian church um, because they're having divisions among them. There's been some disagreement, a misinterpretation of a letter that had been previously sent. Um, and then the congregation is sort of disagreeing with each other, and there's arguments. And I am sure at St. Andrews, you guys have never had any disagreements. But generally, when people get together, there are disagreements. And that's because of the way God created us. We, we tend to have our own perspectives We've lived our lives and we have experiences that shape and form our opinions and our thoughts. And they often differ with the people sitting next to us, the people down the pew from us. We come to the table really, really different, yet we are united by the one spirit of the Holy Spirit. You see, God intended for us to be different, to have these differing opinions, to having different perspectives. It's what makes life rich and wonderful. In fact, the Apostle Paul actually addresses that a little bit later in chapter 12 when he talks to us about what the church looks like when he says this. Christ is just like the human body. A body is a unit and has many parts, and all the parts of the body are one body, even though they are many. We were all baptized by one spirit into one body, 
whether Jew or Greek or slave or free, we are all given one spirit to drink. Certainly the body isn't one part, but many. What that is teaching us is God really intentionally made us different. And so that means he understood that there would be times when we would disagree. There would be times when we had to remember who we were and the power of the, the Holy Spirit to unite us. So Paul is reminding the church really of just some basic truth. He's reminding them that, hey, you guys can be united even though you have different opinions. You can be united by the Holy Spirit. And that's great hope to us. Because that tells us that the truth of God can come to us and can be applied to daily living, that, that there's truth, that this is a relevant word that is alive and living. And it can help us in any situation, any situation we go through, even when it's a pandemic, even when there is hurt and pain happening right now is we really begin to look at the racial inequities in our in our culture that this is a time of great um, brokenness and fear in our country and in the world and that we can look to scripture to find the answer that we can look to scripture to find our hope over the past six weeks First United Methodist Church of Winter Park gave us a very generous renewal leave. They gave us six weeks off. Um, I can't remember, well, I do remember the last time I wasn't working. When we left seminary, um, we moved to Winter Park, and I was seven months pregnant. And for two months, I did not work. It didn't make any sense to start working at that point. And I had two weeks off, and I had a lot of time. But following that, I immediately had my daughter, and then I started taking in other kids to sort of help with the budget. In fact, I have worked since I've been 13. Um, I have never not worked. I don't remember a single summer where I just took it off. And so this idea that we were going to have six weeks, man, I just, I didn't even, couldn't imagine what it meant. And I envisioned lazy days of relaxing and, and times of meditating and talking to God and just really renewing my spirit. But I quickly learned that's not how it was going to be. In fact, I headed down a, a, a side road that I didn't anticipate. My spiritual journey kind of went down. Um, and, and what I realized and what I would known in the past and just simply forgotten is that I'm a person who needs to be very intentional in building in spaces for God in my schedule, building in times for study and prayer, having a schedule where I am constantly um, looking to God throughout the day. And that for me, all that time, that open time, I wasn't intentional enough. I mention that to you because I think that's one of the things that the Apostle Paul is trying to say to the church in Corinth. He's, he's trying to encourage them to be intentional in their spiritual journey. He reminds them that the Holy Spirit is at work in their lives, but it also requires some intentionality that we can do because we all get distracted by life. We get distracted when things are going well, and we get distracted when things are going um, are, are difficult and challenging. And we, we almost can set God on a shelf and not pull him down till it's Sunday morning and it's time for live stream worship. And then we're like, oh yeah, we're Christians and we pray and we sing and we, we look to God. When in reality, those are the things that we're supposed to be plugging into all day long, every day of the week. That's why live stream is so important. It, it pulls us in, and while it's not ideal, why we'd all prefer to be here in person, promise, I promise you, I wish you were all sitting in these pews that I, that I could be worshiping beside you. The reality is, is that live stream worship still aligns our heart to God. And, and for those of you that are in small groups or have been thinking about doing small groups on Zoom, when I started doing small groups on Zoom, I was so consumed with, like, what I didn't like about it that I almost missed that, hey, wait a minute, I'm gathering with the community to talk about things of faith. That, that this virus doesn't stop us from times of prayer. In fact, we can increase our time of prayer because we might just have more time 
to really dive deep and, and, and search the heart of God. Because that's what Christians are called to do. And, and I think that's what Paul says. In fact, Paul actually says mature Christians. Now, let me define what he means by that. Because when we hear mature Christians, we often think, oh, those are those people who have um, memorized a lot of Scripture or who have been going to church for 50 years. But that's not at all what Paul means here. In this particular passage, when Paul says mature, he is simply saying people who are followers of Jesus Christ. Whether you've been a Christian for 50 years or maybe you just became a Christian yesterday, you are mature or that you have the capacity by the power of the Holy Spirit to have the wisdom of God at work in your life. And that's kind of crazy. I mean, shouldn't that be something we earn? Shouldn't that be something we work towards? And there are times when Paul talks about the body of Christ maturing in the faith, going deeper. There are times, but in this passage, he is simply pointing out that maturity is God's wisdom at work in your life, and you can get it immediately when you have the Holy Spirit within you. And why is that so important? Well, that, that's important because of everything that is happening around us. We are in the midst of a time where we need hope. And so that hope is going to come to us through God's wisdom. It will be the whisper in our ear that is going to keep us going day in and day out and helping us to make God-directed decision, um, decisions and that we um, continue to follow his leading. So, so how do you know? How do you know when it's God's wisdom at, or your wisdom in your life? How can you tell the difference? Well, there, there's a couple of things you need to know about this to know the difference. Number one, it's simple. What do I mean about that? You don't have to be eloquent to share the truth of Jesus Christ. You simply have to share your story of faith. Do you know that God can use that simple story of faith to change hearts and minds? Sometimes it's just as simple as, hey, I'll pray for you. To expand the kingdom of God. It's that simple. That's the amazing thing, the confounding thing about God's wisdom. Secondly, Anyone, as we've already said, can, can have the wisdom of God. Um, it could be the uneducated, the foolish, the people you like, the people you dislike, um, the people um, in, uh, who live around you. If you're a follower of Jesus, it's not about perfections. It's about understanding that the mind of Christ is in you. And you can share that. You can live that out. That's why we can hear the, the wisdom of Jesus sometimes in the voice of a child or a teenager or, or someone you don't even care for. If they're a follower of Jesus, the wisdom of Christ can come through in ways that just totally can confound us, but also give us hope. A third way to know that the wisdom of God is present is that it doesn't have to be validated by, by a, a miracle. It doesn't have to be validated by human logic. In fact, often it seems the opposite of human logic. And you don't even have to have perfect faith to have God's wisdom. You just simply have to decide to trust him. Even when you have doubts. Even, you just keep returning back to God that you're going to trust him. Have fear, have doubt, just keep coming back to I will trust God. That is godly wisdom. Another way is that what you'll find about godly wisdom is it'll never pump you up and make you feel arrogant. Instead, it will humble you to your very core. You may think you'll get full of arrogance because you're wise. Instead, it's the opposite. You understand it all comes from God. And lastly, the thing about God's wisdom, it will not leave you feeling hopeless, but it will leave you transformed. Let me share with you personally what it has looked like for me in godly wisdom through COVID. Um, I like to live a well-ordered life. I like to plan. COVID has forced me to throw that out the window. What we've learned in COVID is that everything we plan generally falls apart. And I, I'm, that's hard for me because, and there's nothing wrong with being a good planner, but when it leaves me frustrated, I just have had to learn to release things in a new sort of way. 
And I have a lot of things to worry about in my mind. I feel justified in wanting control because I'm worried, will my daughters be able to return to UF this fall? Will, will my dad be okay without my mom? Will we ever get to know the people of St. Andrews when we're all wearing a mask and we don't get to gather? There's a lot to worry about, but every time I start getting filled with fear, I feel the whisper of God in my ear say, one day at a time. And I remember the words of Scripture that reminds me that I don't have to have all the answers. Because God has prepared things for those who love him that no eye has seen or ear has heard or that haven't crossed the mind of any human being. God has revealed these things to us through the Spirit. And so we don't know what the future holds, but God does. And we will rest in him. And we will look to his wisdom to help us continue our journey and expand the kingdom of God. Will you join me in prayer? Loving and merciful God, we thank you for your graciousness, your understanding of us that we need your wisdom, your understanding of us that we can simply look to you and by your grace, by your spirit, we can have the wisdom of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives, guiding us to the place you would have us go. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I have to confess that this is the first time I've served communion virtually. And there's every ounce of me inside of me through my seminary training saying, you're not supposed to do it this way. This isn't the way you do it. This isn't the way you serve communion. You're supposed to all be gathered together, representing the body of Christ in community. You're supposed to be sharing from the same bread and the same cup. You're supposed to have the pastor there to, to minister, or to minister, bless the elements in person. But it's not to be. We're all, ga- we're all scattered. You're, you're at home. We're here. You may not even have bread and juice at home. You may have something else. It just doesn't seem right. But then it reminds us, reminds us that the power of Holy Communion is not in the bread and the juice and the people to gather together. The power of communion is in God. The means of grace is represented in this simple act. The act that God pours out his grace to us to forgive our sins, to give us a, a salvation offered to all, and to give us God's love to each one of us unconditionally, freely. That's where the power of this act is. We are reminded of that in this time where we have to do it separately. So I say to you now, remind you that the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to God and broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Eat this, do this in in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup after the dinner and he again thanked God and said, this is my cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Almighty God, pour out your Holy Spirit on this gift of this cup and this juice. And for all those gathered at home, you pour out your Holy Spirit to remind us of the power of the means of grace that you give to us. Let it be for us the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives to give us freedom, deliverance, salvation, mercy, and grace. As we partake of it, know that we're partaking it with others gathered around in other areas, and all in homes or in churches, and that we are all united in the body of Christ. Amen. I ask you now at home to share in your uh, elements, and for those who are gathered here to come forward to receive the elements.
When I was a wasteland, you are the water. When I am the winter, you are the fire that burns. When I am a long night, you are the sunrise. When I desert, you are the river that turns to find me. What have I done to deserve a love like this? What have I
worship this morning. We hope you have an awesome week. We'll see you back here at 945 next week. Uh, make sure you join us this afternoon after the 1115 service to come welcome our new pastors. Have an awesome week. See you next time. Kind of love that God only knows. God only knows what you've been through.